wait a few minutes, but more people come and I'll mention uh, some details about the project uh, presentation, which will start uh, next week. So I will, I, I will uh, on on Friday, the class on Friday, I'll I'll I'll, I'll put out a schedule of who's talking on Wednesday, who's talking Friday of the of, of the following week, um, and I think. Everyone will get about 10 minutes to talk. Um, so, so if you have a group of two, you get a total of 20 minutes. You have a group of one, you get a total of 10 minutes. Group of three, 30 minutes. And I'll try to figure out how to do that. Um, and, and so, um, but what we're going to talk about um, today and on Friday is some um, distributed algorithms for dealing with large-scale data. So um, today will be more about kind of how the how the infrastructure and routing can work in a certain setting, um, something called distributed hash tables. And then Friday we'll talk about some distributed streamings, which will be more on some algorithms uh, type pop. So I, I'm sorry, it's it's really cold in this room. The heater is, is, says it's up all the way. Um, I guess. If it gets too cold, raise your hand and we'll all do a lap around the room. <laughs> it's easy for me. I'm up here, kind of. I can flap my arms to stay warm or something. Um, okay, so um, we'll talk we'll talk about um, uh, on distributed algorithms. Um, and so here the the, the goal or the, the this is kind of a different parallelish setting for really large data, and the idea is that you have a bunch of um, of, um, of different computers, and each computer associated with it um, has um, some data. Um, and so, so, so typically when we talk to, and you think about each of these as like a processor and we'll store some of the data. Um, and so when we talked about um, parallel algorithms, we said, okay, you can, um, you can data, any processor can say, say access data in some shared way. And when we talked about MapReduce, there's a very organized way that there's some, some uh, the, the nodes could, could talk to each other and there was some, some coordinator which was Trying to um, um, master node, which was um, figuring out how the how the algorithms would talk to each other. In the in the GPUs, there's a very rigid hierarchy in the processors and how the data moved. Here, we're going to be a lot more more flexible in this, and we're going to say, you know, you just have all of these these computers, and um, they can each store data and they can each talk to each other, but you know, communication between them is 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 going to be expensive. Um, so you, you can talk in between um, these these nodes, um, right? So you can talk between them, but it's uh, it's uh, um, it, it, it's going to be less less organized. Okay. Um, so it, one of the something you never worry about with GPUs, but um, Maybe you do have to worry about this, but but it's not really a focus. And you and you worried somewhat about with MapReduce is that these nodes can sometimes fail. So we're going to talk about settings which is needs to be um, here, which is needs to be far more robust um, than in MapReduce. And we're going to not really talk so much about the actual computation. We're really going to focus on the communication. So we're going to talk about sending the data in between these nodes. Um, now. But one of the things about the GPUs is they have this hierarchy, so it was very limited which kind of which nodes could talk to which nodes. You could talk to the ones directly below you or above you, but you didn't really think about it like that. You thought about having a, an architecture and a memory. Now these nodes can can talk. They can say each of them has an ID. They say I wanna I wanna. Um, Send a message to one with ID number two, and I'm ID number seven, so I can I can send the message. Well, we have to think a little bit more about how how this actually works. Now. Right? If you 
have a really large number of these nodes, say you have, have a million of these, you don't necessarily want to keep track of um, which, um, which nodes are up, which nodes are down. If you try to send a message to node number two, um, and node two is down, then, then what happens? You send something off into the ether and it you know, kind of disappears. So you need to worry a little bit about this. And maybe if one node is kind of a hub and is supposed to, um, you know, is supposed to help route all this stuff, and there are a million nodes now in an unorganized way, there's going to be way too much traffic, traffic through this hub. So we want to avoid these sorts of things. Um, so, so this is kind of a high-level view of, of this, of th this area. Um, we'll talk about streaming aspects of this on Friday with a little bit more structure. But today we're going to talk about what's called um, these um, distributed. Um, Um, distributed hash tables, these are sometimes often abbreviated DHT. Um, and th this is a way mainly of storing and routing information on some network like this. Um, and it, it's, it, it's going to ensure that if, if nodes go down often, you're not going to lose your data. Um, so is, so, um, I'll, I'll, it's going to be very robust. Um, um, to failure, um, it's it's going to have um, fast routing. Okay, so you want to be able to route something from any node to any other node um, pretty quickly. Um, so so we, you want no node has t too much. Data and th th this was this eventually you know we talked about how this was formalized in the MapReduce model, but early on this was not formalized, and some algorithms you'd have to buffer things in in the hard drive or in the stream somewhere. Here we're actually storing data, so we need to be uh, very very careful about this. And we're going to have um, um, small degree. So this means that. No node is in charge of talking to too many other nodes. You don't have a master node which knows about all of the nodes. Um, and so this, th this is important for efficiency. That node can get overwhelmed. Uh, that node is, has too much to keep track of if nodes go down or not. Um, and then all, so next I'm gonna tell kind of a story of how these were developed and you'll see that there's actually, um, um, there's actually important legal reason why you don't wanna do this either. If, if anyone knows the backstory of how these DHTs, uh, uh, how they came about. So, okay, so, so here's kind of a um, history lesson. So, um, so who's heard of um, Napster? So who's, who's heard of Napster? Okay, so did, have you, did you hear of it before watching the movie The Social Network? Okay. Yeah, so, so, um, so for those who don't know about Napster, this is around 1999, and so the, the, this was a way of connecting together um, computers in this way. Um, it, it didn't have all these properties yet, but such that people could share, um, share information across the internet. Um, you know, th th there's perfectly valid reasons for doing this. Say you're in a research collaboration, you want to share a large data set. Um, but people tended to use it for things like, um, this was before movies, you could do this, you could transfer, but they shared it for uh, MP3s. So people are sharing all sorts of music on computers across the globe on the internet. And in order to keep track of it, there's this software called Napster, which was developed. Um, and so, it, and so what it allowed people to do is to, uh, to say, I have these MP3s, they're on a folder on my computer, I'm making these public to share, and other people can go and download those MP3s, and you can download MP3s from someone else's, uh, someone else's computer. Um, technically, you weren't supposed to do this with MP3s, um, and there were a lot of people who were, who were sued, including this company, um, and it was, it was eventually, you know, there's lawsuits and it was it was shut down, but 
you know, in order for that to happen, it got very popular. There were a lot of people using it, a lot of nodes. And so um, basically, it, it was the architecture had a, um, had a central node, and this node kept track, managed to keep track of all the other nodes, right, that were up. So this was, so if, this was, this was one limiting factor in, in how large this could get, but there's one central node which kept track of everyone else who was on, on, on this network. And so then the, um, the data was stored um, distributedly. Um, so, and so, if you wanted to, um, and then all routing uh, was um, uh, was through this uh, was through the central network, right? So, this is, so, so if you wanted to find an MP3, you went to the central node and you and you you searched for it, and it would give you a list of all the different places where you you could download this MP3 from. And maybe there are some statistics based on which ones were closer to you. Um, they would recommend this to be faster download times. Some had faster connections. Uh, in, in '99, the the difference in some people's connections was was was. Uh, uh, was really dramatic and probably much more different than it is now. If you were on, people are still using, you know, doing stuff over the phone lines on a modem, um, and other people were on some some university campuses were very well wired. Well, well, even the, there are others that that worked. Like some were on on, on backbones and others weren't. And so certain university campuses were were very, um, had, you could you could download stuff from very fast and. Students, of course, said, oh, this is a cool technology, let me do this, and um, they actually got in trouble. I had friends who, so I actually had a, had a roommate who was hosting something like this on our campus, and his was the second biggest network on campus. Um, the biggest one got busted, and the guy got in a lot of trouble. My roommate ended up being okay, somehow. Um, Are this similar to DC++? What? DC++. Nowadays, people use uh, peer to peer sharing. Kind of yeah, yeah. So, so the, the, this is the history of peer to peer sharing. Okay. Right? So, 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 um, so Napster was the original way of doing this, which was not truly peer to peer. Mm -hmm. Right? But this is, this is what got the attention of everyone. The first really big network, a lot of people were sharing things. It wasn't peer to peer. Okay. So, this was, this got in trouble. One, the central node had to route everything, and this was taking too long. The other issue is that um, they, uh, the, the, the music industry could come and say, look, the central node is all the information of who is what and who's sharing it. I can go and, and uh, I can shut down the central node and the whole thing gets shut down and I can sue the person hosting the central node. Right? Um, so th this, this ran into problems and th this site was very popular, made a lot of noise, but was um, um, but this was shut down, you know. But, um, so then there was there was another thing that came out. Um, um, Nutella, and this was around 2000. Okay, so um, so this, so Nutella said um, on query send to everyone. Okay, so, so it had a bunch of computers on the, on the network, and every query searching for stuff sent to in individual machines and it returned back from all over the place. Do you have this MP3? And then they would return back, yes, I have it or not, and then you, you're, then you would get information of how long it took to do, and you would try and download for, for, for one of them. Um, so you can, you can say you have the MP3, and that's, that's okay. It's, it's illegal, the part is the... Is the downloading part, and so there's no central node, so um, the, you couldn't take down the central node and uh, shut down uh, um, the network. So, so the data was also stored and, um, distributedly. Um, so this was good if, if, if there are 10 people with the same MP3 you wanted, and one of them goes offline, um, you know, but then, then there's still nine other people. Right? So you can download from one to other nine people, and if it's a popular song, probably lots of people have it. 
So it's, it was fairly robust. You could usually find what you wanted. Um, but it was, um, it was slower. And this is because you queried everyone, and that means everyone was querying you as well. So if you were hosting something, you'd be bombarded with lots of queries all the time, even for stuff you didn't have, right? So say you had a very eclectic set of music and you were willing to share this, you're going to get queries for, um, for music by Lady Gaga all the time. Right? Well, this it probably wasn't Lady Gaga back then, but I don't know, in 2000, what was the, what was the hit song back then? Uh, maybe Britney Spears, probably, right? <laughs> so probably there's some Britney Spears song at home was listening to. Um, okay. Um, so, and, and so the, this one was, was not, I forget if this one ever, if they figure out how to shut this down, but um, it, it, there wasn't a central node they could shut down, um, but it, was, it couldn't really scale that well um, because the queries were sent to everyone. This is kind of like if, if you're, you know, if, if you're building a, uh, like a binary, if, if you're building a search data structure and it's not a binary tree, you just check every single element to see if it's there, right? The, this is not going to be very efficient. Um, so the, this, this didn't really survive because it was, it was not scalable. Um, so so the, there's also something called um, clean net. So I, uh, um, I think some version of Nutella stuck around for a while. I don't know. They probably updated how they did things, but I think this name may still exist, or at least it did for, for, for a long time. There's something called FreeNet, which also came out around 2000, that was also, um, that it was also distributed storage, but it had um, uh, um, some heuristic routing. Um, so it didn't query everyone. It tried to somehow route to the answer in some way to find something without an index, but it was not guaranteed to actually find stuff if it was there. So, um, so if you had a query, the, the query was not guaranteed to tell you, you know, it could have been s s someone had some special, you know, music that you're trying to find in, but you wouldn't find it for some reason. So it was, it was not guaranteed to work, and um, so, but, but I think it was, it, it had things that were, um, so that it, it avoided the legal, the worst legal issues of, of Napster. Okay. Um, so then around, um, so around 2000, 2001, some pretty ex exciting stuff happened, and this all happened inside of academics. These were, um, Napster was a company, I think these were, these may have been like open source projects or something. Then inside of academics, some people sat down and said, if we were to do this, what is, what is kind of the right way to build a peer-to-peer -peer system like this? And there were several things that came out almost simultaneously. There were essentially four different products that came out all in 2001. Um, you know, two of them got published, two of them, I think, actually never got published because they were scooped, but they were, they were available online, and I think some of them, they may say all exist, all exist in some form. So the technical first one was called Cord, and this was in October of 2001. There was also Pastry, which came out in November of 2001. Uh, at least this is when I forget where I got these dates. There's also um, something called Tapestry and, and, and Can. And these were both only tech reports. These never were officially published. So these officially got scooped. These, I think, were simultaneously, although these people claim that they were technically first. But if you talk to these people, they'll say, well, you know, ours is better, and they should have been simultaneous. So there is some controversy back then. So I knew, I think, I think it was the pastry people I knew some of them, but kind of offhand. Um, okay, so so all of these had um, 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 decentralized storage. Um, and uh, 
and routing. And um, they're extremely um, fault tolerant. Um, and, and they're also scalable. That means that um, there's fast routing. Um, and um, uh, and the degree is small. And, and I'll explain a bit more. Um, so so I'll go through now and kind of explain this more in detail. So so all of these kind of had these these properties. They they solved things that were that were missing that were missing before. This one did not have great routing. It was not very fault tolerant. So it was fault tolerant, but it was not very scalable. This one had the central node, so it wasn't scalable, and it had problems with had the legal problems, right? Um, okay. Okay. So, 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 I'll try and so I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna give an overview of how um, of. Um, I think I'll get over you. I think it's pastry I'm describing. It's, it's one of them. I wrote down the kind of in more detail to see. If, Kind of how these work. So, um, yeah. And these two previous and uh, a so new tele uh, working on peer to peer systems. They're they're kind of they're predecessors of peer to peer systems or the very in, initial versions of them. Um, so so how the actual so the, the thing I'm going to describe is something for a system for storing and maybe even doing. Computing on, on data and being able to recover and query it. Um, if you have your data and you want to share that, um, you would uh, you would you'd have to tweak tweak these a little bit. So if you want to know how you know something like you know um, how, how these how these peer to peer systems you download your movies are like, there's there's some other stuff on top because only you are storing your movies. Other people are storing their movies and. Uh, here you're going to put data into the system, and it's going to get routed and stored in, in someone's machine. So you you don't have control over what's being stored in your machine. Um, so it's it's a it's, it's it's a little bit different, but the the, the routing is definitely and the ideas are definitely based on, on the, uh, these these three different systems. Um, okay, so um, okay, one of the key ideas is and it's the key idea is because it's the key space. Um, and so we're going to call this K. And so you're going to think of this is going to work from your data. You're going to pump this into, um, so you, you, you're going to do like a, um, a SHA-1 um, hash on your, on your data. And it's going to output a value in the key space. Okay, so. Call this. We'll call this function um, h, which will go from data to the key space. Okay. Um, and, and so now every that means every piece of data. So if you have a, a certain file which is storing, say, a movie, part of a movie, or MP3 or something, you're you're going to run to the hash function, and that'll give it some some number. Okay. So this key space is um, so. so Key is basically going to be two to say 128. There's some systems that use more bits, but this is some 128 bits. So you're going to assign it some random um, value with uh, 128 zeros and ones, and that'll describe some sort of some sort of location. Um, and then the it's useful to think of the key space as a ring. Um, so you're going to have Here's going to be zero, 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 right? And then, um, and then it's going to wrap around, and then this is going to be zero, zero, one, right? And then, you know, and and so forth. And it's a lot of zeros, so I'm not going to write them all. And then you're going to come back around here, and uh, then on on the other side you're going to have all ones, right? So these are going to be right next to each other. So so it's uh, 
And then, for instance, down here is going to be, say, um, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and right next to it is 1, 0, 0, 0. Right, so, it's, so this is a circular system. Um, so you think of the circular key space. Um, and so th this will be useful uh, for a picture. Um, and so then um, you, you're going to have different um, computers which are going to be on this network, right? So you're going to have data and computers, and they're both going to live in this key space. So, um, so you're going to have a set of um, computers. Let's call them P, um, P1 up to Pn, say. And so you're going to have, this may be the location of Pi, right? So this will be hashed here. Um, and let's say that this will have um, ID I, and so um, and so each of them is going to be hashed to a random location. So this may be the first one. Um, the, the next one is going to be let's call this. J. Um, this may be one. H of P two is going to be over here, um, and then there's going to be some. So let's call this um, seven, maybe ID J plus one, right? So you can put all these computers around here, and they hash. Them. You're going to give them a random value, and so because the you're giving them a random hash, they're going to be distributed pretty well around this key space. They're going to be pretty evenly distributed. You can look at. We've done some different randomized analysis in this class, and. Um, and so if you select things and place them randomly, some space, they're not going to be too bunched up. You may have some things close together, but you're not going to have any gap which is too big, which would be an important problem. Um, and so now you're going to see um, two, two of these computers will get hashed next to each other, and these will be consecutive. And so now you're also going to have all of your pieces of data that you want to store in the system. So then, um, so so you're also going to hash um, hash your data, and this data may hash to a point right here. Okay. So, so now, what you're going to do is you're going to say, let's look at um, some number of neighbors in in every direction, and I'm going to store this data on these these neighbors. In the key space. Yeah. Are we using two hash functions like one for? It's the same or? hash function, and that's a, that's important. You want to, um, well, it's, it's, it's probably not that important actually, um, but the, they need to both map to the same domain, right? They both need to map to the same key space. Is what's important. Now the, the the input may look different for, from a, a data set. Maybe some large number of bits. How you store your data? You create some key with SHA and hash. And the computers may not need. Maybe you just hash the IP address. So it's a lot less data. So there's there might be a different way a different way. But they both need to map to the same key space. So, so that's what's important. So they essentially live in the same in the same um, domain. And so then. If you map data to this domain, you can find the neighboring computers in, in it. So that's important. So th th that means if you only know um, if you if you only know the name of the data that, um, that you want, if you only know its uh, hash value, you can look up where the data is stored. It's gonna you can you can find this place in the key space, and then you can find the neighbors here, and then. These neighbors will store it, and you send it to multiple neighbors in case some of them go down. And I'll talk a bit more about how many neighbors you would you would send this to um, a little bit later. Um, okay, so so this is so roughly all the computers get an ID which lives in the key space, and all of your data which you want to store in it, you are going to send to some place in the key space, and then it'll get stored on the nearby on the computers which are which are nearby. Um, okay. So, um, so this is all. Um, okay. 
Okay, so it is. So now, if you want to do um, routing on here, so let's say I I have some some data that I want to know. Uh, um, I want to find all of the computers which are nearby this element of key space, right? So I know that this data lives there. I want to say find the data, and, and maybe the data points to other data that, that I, I want to get, or I, um, I want to place this data in this structure. How do I, how do I get to here? So the only thing that the, you're allowed to store on each of these computers is, um, is a list of addresses of other computers. Right? And you want to keep this list small. If, if, if each computer stores too many other ones, then there are two issues. One is the, it's, it'll act like a central node, and it could get in, in legal trouble. It may also get overloaded with, uh, with, with information. And second, it needs to um, keep track of whether these things are going down or not. And, you don't, and these machines may leave all the time, and you want to be very um, robust to this sort of, um, sort of thing. Um, okay, so, um, so, 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 so the key thing here, um, so, let's, I didn't say, did I say what, okay, so let's, okay, so, so, <laughs> How's the routing work? You're gonna you're gonna um, have this piece of data, and you're gonna get some value v, and you're gonna um, and so then um, you're gonna say on the computer on um, pi, you're going to um, so so this is an element of the key space, so so you're going to um, if um, if p um, if hash of p i is um, close to v, um, then uh, uh, then you can return the data, right? So so if you if the hash of your of your computer is going to be close to here, then then it's you, you're probably going to be one of these neighbors, and you probably have, mm -hmm. have the data. So if you have the data stored on your computer, uh, um, then you can return it. So this is the base case. If you don't, then you need to find another computer that does. Okay, and all you know, um, and you're going to have a list of computers. So then what you do is. Um, 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 so else, um, find um, in in the list on pi closest hash of pj um, to d. So you're going to find. So you're going to store on your on the on each of the computers. So what is PI is going to store is it's going to have all of its data, and then it's going to have this list PI, and it's going to store um, hash of PJ1, and it's then it's going to store the um, say the IP address of this guy, and then it's going to hash of PJ2, and it's going to have its IP address. Right, so, so if you don't have the data on your set, then you're going to find the one in the list that has the closest hash function to it. Um, and then you're going to um, go and send this request to this IP address, which you have stored. So you only maintain a list which is not going to be too big, and you're going to route to the elements on the list. And, um, so, and, and what you want is that the, this, this eventually will find a... Um, uh, a computer which is close enough to V, um, because you found you always send it to the 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 one in your list which is as the closest here. You, you're always decreasing the distance, so you're always getting closer. Okay. So, 
Um, so this is basically, it's a, it's a basic, fairly simple, greedy routing algorithm. Um, the, the question now is, how do you construct this list so that you're guaranteed that it's not going to take too long and you don't have too many um, elements in the list? Okay. Um, so, so let me start by kind of drawing a picture of how this list sh should work. Um, so I'm going to think of this list from one node, say, um, let's say it's this one here. So which other nodes are going to be in this list? So you're going to break this down into a few um, uh, groups. So you're going to have, um, so you're going to have um, L, um, the L closest nodes in key space. Okay. Um, so you're going to have the L closest nodes, so that um, the, these are really useful in case you, um, if when you when you are when you you join the network, you want to have the data that's nearby your key space. And these are going to be from the ones that have similar IDs. So you're going to copy over this, the data from these so that you're, you're backing, backing this data up. Um, and, and if you don't have something and you're very close, it's going to be in some of your, in one of your neighbors lists. Um, okay. um, you're also going to have a set um, M. Okay, so, so you can also have an M um, with the um, the M nodes with the smallest latency. Okay, so w when you join this network, you're placed in here randomly among all the nodes, right? So, and if you're in one of these peer-to-peer -peer networks, there are nodes from from Europe, from Asia, from all over the world on here. And if you're routing to something um, in China, it's going to be a lot slower than if there was someone else on, on campus um, who was who is also uh, also in the network. So you're going to find the ones with the smallest latency and put these in your list as well. Some of these may end up being close, but in expectation, they'll, they'll, be, they'll be far away. If you do this, this will kind of improve the, 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 the actual um, speed of practice. It's not going to um, add any uh, theoretical improvements to the, the, the routing algorithm. Um, but in practice, it'll make a big difference. It'll allow you to kind of do a, a good first step in every routing. Um, so then you're going to think of this. So, so then you're going to have, um, th then th th this is kind of the easy part. And then you're going to have a bunch of things that are going to help you do the routing. And to do this, let's think of the key space. Right, so this key space is going to be 128, um, 128 of these bits. And you're going to break these bits into size um, B. Okay, so there's going to be, of these, the, there's going to be 128 over B of these buckets. So you think of B as, as, as 4. So um, B equals 4 is usually is, is a number that I think is used inside uh, uh, pastry. And so, um, so, so what's going to, um, so now if you look at your, your idea of your computer, um, the, the nodes which are going to be closer to you are going to be the ones that match the first as many bits as possible at the beginning. After you have a bit that's wrong, it doesn't matter so much the bits afterwards. So, um, so you, you're going to see. Um, so, the 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 distance between hash of pi and hash of pj, if um, um, it, it, it is going to be um, the. the um, is this size of, of the largest um, 
matching prefix. Right? So, so, so you want to find how many bits you can match at the beginning. Okay? Um, so, so now, the other elements in the list, you're going to see, I, for, for every number of, for, for every bin, you want to say, in the, in the first, um, if there are any other nodes that have, um, of these buckets, so let's say that there are going to be, 120 divided by 4 is going to be 32, right? So if there are 31 buckets matching, then you're going to, um, then these are going to be very close to you. So you're going to say, um, for all J in 128 over B, um, choose two to the B nodes with um, length um, or with uh, prefix of J um, matching buckets. Okay, so if J is equal to 3, then that means that I'm going to make sure the first three buckets are matching. They have the exact same, ex exact same bits here in the, in the key. And then I'm going to choose 2 to the B from, you know, they can have any bits here. So I'll choose 2 to the B here. And maybe I choose them randomly. Maybe I choose them so they have a small latency. Um, so you, you may want to do it randomly because small latency may be a problem. Say you're looking for um, some MP3s from music and, you know, that's, you know, it's, uh, maybe it's K-pop. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, maybe you're looking for Korean pop music. So no one in, in Salt Lake has Korean pop music. You probably need to find computers in Korea. Um, so if you always connect it to ones with small latency, you're going to ha have a hard time routing to ones which are in uh, Korea because you're, you're, um, you're going to have a hard time um, because you're going to tend to link to locally. So you're going to choose, probably choose these two to the B nodes um, randomly. Okay, so, so, um, so, so this is going to give you a total of 128 over B times 2 to the B nodes. Um, so I saw some typical numbers for this, and these, these might, be, might be outdated, um, is that, let's see, uh, So, so this may be roughly 500 nodes. Um, what was this? This was roughly 32, and maybe this was going to be um, 16. I think that's roughly, roughly 500 at the bottom. Um, so you're going to have roughly 500 nodes. Um, okay, so, so does this list make sense? So you're going to have um, a set. Um, so, so the third component here is going to be a set. Um, a set S, which is described here, and so you can think of this set S as as, as follows. Um, you're going to have two to the B elements. Um, so this will be I equals zero, and so these are going to have th th these are going to have any bits at all. So if I equals one, you have two to the B elements here, and so the first bucket is, is going to match. I equals two, two to the B here, this is going to match, and this is going to match, and these can be anything. Right, and so eventually down here you're going to have um, I equals 128 over B, two to the B, or um, and then each of these, um, all of these have to match. So these are going to be very close. These are probably going to be very far away. Okay, so, 
So, so now let's, now that I've described all the nodes that you keep track of, so that maybe M, L and M together are going to be roughly uh, no more than 100, you have 600 nodes you keep track of. So it seems to be a fairly, fairly large scale for this to make sense. If you're in a much smaller scale setting, you might reduce the key space from 128 down to, down to something uh, much smaller. Um, okay, so now let's look at this greedy routing algorithm. Okay, so now you want to find in the list, so if you don't have the element, you want to find in the list the one that's the closest um, to this value that you have. And so you can check the closest nodes and the ones with the smallest latency first maybe. This is some smallish number. Um, if it's not in this set, then um, what you want to do is start looking at this, this other set S and you want to start from the close ones. Um, if you're, um, and actually if you look at the, the, this, this uh, value V that you're trying to find, you can look at how many of its bits match your ID, and if 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 um if if none of them match, then the closest one needs to be in this first set up here, because all of these are going to be farther away because these match your ID, and the ones in the query uh, value v don't match, so it would have to be in this set, right? If if the if the first um you know. Um, say 2b bits match, then the closest one will probably be in this set of these 2 to the b items that you're going to look at. So these, so 2 to b is say 16, so you look at these 16 items and find the closest one in here. Okay, so um, now why is 2 to the b interesting? Why did I choose 2 to the b elements from each of these, each of these bins? So what it probably means is that for, if you look at the next bin over here, the one that, the first one which does not match, there are going to be two to the b different ways of putting bits in here. Actually, there's, I think it's actually two to the b minus one because you want them to be different than the, than the bits you have. Okay, so you want them not to match um, the, the first bit here. So then there's 2 to the b minus 1, and you can make this minus 1 if you need to. But, okay. So for each of the choices of bits here, you're going to choose probably choose one node from the network, and it can be anything in the rest of the bits. What this means is that every time that you, that you route and you call this recursively on a different node, the match is getting closer. Okay, because more bits are at least one more bit is matching, and hopefully, um, hopefully many more bits. Right? If you have two to the b things here, then there's at least one of these nodes which has all of its bits is matching. So that means that so how many so that means how many jumps is it going to need to take in order to find um, in order to find a node that has it? Well, for each of the buckets, every time I route to here, then when I'm on the node that was in this set, I know the first so many bits are matching, and then I can look in this bucket space. So there are only, um, if there are only 20, 120 over B is 32, I know there's at most 32 jumps that I need to make. Okay, and, and this, is, this is logarithmic in the size of the key space. Um, so that's great, but you know I don't necessarily want to do 32 jumps. This is this is actually a lot. Um, I, I'd rather it be logarithmic in the size of the actual um, of the actual number of nodes I have in the network. As I have more and more nodes, it's going to take longer to route. As I have fewer nodes, um, I want to, I want it to route faster, right? So. That's why I also keep the set L with, with these closest nodes in it. So if you so if I have two to the 128 nodes, the, the data is only going to be stored locally in some region here. It's going to be replicated on, on several different nodes. I need to get into this small subspace of the key space. And I probably need to match 
maybe 127 of the bits. You know, so something like that in order to find here. But, but if I, if instead um, there are only something like um, um, 1,000 or 10,000 nodes in the network, then these neighbors are going to be much larger jumps in the key space. Right? So, so that means that these neighbors may only match um, on the first, um, you know, um, in, maybe in the first five buckets, but they're still neighbors in the key space. So that means when I route, I only need to make five steps here among the buckets, and then I found one of my, um, I found one that knows that has the data. Okay, so, so this routing will adjust to the, um, the, the size of your network. And so, you know, it also means that if the size of the network is, is not that big, I don't actually need to store all of these nodes here, or these, um, because there may not be any nodes that match in all of the bits. That's probably, probably unlikely unless you have a huge network. So even though this could be of size 500, um, the, the total number of, of, uh, of, 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 uh, of computers in this, in this list, um, you, only if the network is actually that big do you actually store them. So it automatically adjusts the size of the network, which is pretty cool. Um, okay, so all right. So uh, so 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 any any questions on, on how this works? This is kind of the overall summary of how you would store this data distributedly and then you would you would look this data up. How do you measure distance through the network to a given node? Like, yeah, we can do a, a trace route and <clears throat> Well there there are two ways two ways of doing it. One is the is um, is is based on the distance and key space. Right? That that, that gives you kind of a a a, a um, conceptual way of doing the distance. Um, there's also a notion of latency in the network, where you can measure by doing doing a ping or something like that. There's there's different utilities to kind of measure the latency between your computer and another computer, and so there may be some sort of a local map of other nodes on the network that you can you can you can ping. If you find one that's close, then the ones that one is close to, you're probably also likely close to. We'll probably figure out that way. I, I don't know the details of how these things work. Um, probably, if you took the uh, um, the networking class, you would learn learn a lot more about this. Um, okay, so so the, the yeah, so this circle there's another kind of useful way of of, of looking at this the search algorithm. Um, every time you you make one of these jumps, you're matching on. Let's say you match on one additional bit. So if you match on the first bit, you're either in this half or this half, right? So let's say you matched on, on this bit, the first bit was zero. If you matched on the second bit, then you're either zero, zero or zero, one. Every time you match on another bit, you're cutting the key space in half. Okay, so, so then if you look at a picture of, of how this routing is, is working. If you're on this, this node here, like I started drawing a picture before, if you look in this half of this key space, it's the other half, so you're only going to route to some small number of nodes here. So this is only going to be 2 to the b minus 1 nodes in this half of the key space. You're also going to route to um, 2 to the b minus 1 nodes in this quarter of the key space, and then uh, you divided this up one more time, you're going to again route to 2 to the b minus 1 nodes in this eighth of the key space. Right? So, so the, the, this, so if you, if, if a data element is routed to here, um, from somewhere in this key space, in this eighth of the key space, it's routed to this guy, that means that the answer must be in this eighth of the key space, because it's the closest one. If it's closer than here, it must be in this eighth, and that means you're going to cut 
the key space in half in the next step of the route. So this is another kind of conceptual way of doing this. Um, kind of, uh, so some other important facts to mention is because each of the of the um, of the IDs of each of the computers is assigned um, randomly into this key space, it's going to be fairly robust to um, to if if nodes are going down. So say if there's some part of the world where uh, there is there is some sort of uh, earthquake, the, the power went out because of an earthquake, then it could be th those nodes go down, and you don't want this to ruin the routing for the whole network. Well, those nodes will be randomly distributed. Um, so it's unlikely that um, someone will be linked, will have in their list only nodes, uh, um, um, the, the, the only nodes that were down. It's also it's also likely that if you look in this um, this set of neighborhood, so let's say each data item is stored, is replicated on the computers in this part of the key space. Okay, well, these, the, the, the computers which are in here were assigned randomly into that part of the key space. So that means that um, if there were, say, if it's replicated, say, 10 times, then it's likely that if you look at the 10% of the network which is latency-wise close to you, probably one of those nodes will be in this key space will be in the section that stores the data. So they'll, they'll probably be, you know, as the more the data is replicated, the more likely someone close to you has the data. So when they actually want to send it to you, um, the, the, the latency doesn't need to be that far. So the, the, the data is automatically distributed geographically and latency-wise, you know, very, very well on the, on the network. Um, so it's, it's going to be robust to failures because of this randomization which is causing things um, like uh, uh, to, to, to be distributed pretty well. Um, and, um, and then when you join the network, you just need to look at your neighbors to find, uh, to, to kind of figure out which data to copy over um, to, to be robust. And you can find whichever one is the smallest latency or you can distribute that among the other um, computers on the network. Um, OK, so th this was. Technology developed in, say, 2001. Um, this is kind of, um, uh, th there's a lot of this routing kind of uh, ideas is, um, is, is, is key to how these peer-to-peer -peer network works. Um, there are a couple of other um, sort of systems that have been built on top of this or influenced by this. Um, there's, there's a, so one of the, one of the issues um, with MapReduce um, for dealing is that it does not deal with data coming online very efficiently. It's thinking you have a store of data and you're 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 doing some computation from queries on this data. Um, so th this was great in many cases for for Google because the data that they're storing was the web, which is fairly static. It's not changing all that much. Um, so when Twitter and Facebook were growing very quickly. Um, they were more using just their own data. And they were popular because their data was updating very quickly. So MapReduce is not really a very good fit for this. Um, and so what, what they did instead is they built MapReduce-like systems that were kind of roughly based on this distributed hash table. Okay, so when, so they, they this is kind of a very high level description, but, um, all of the, um, so there's, it's called Twitter Storm and then Facebook um, um, Cassandra have some, at least some version of them that has used some ideas like this. And, and so every, every node is located in the key space and then when you want to, you, you, can, you can still describe the process you're doing as a series of maps and reduces. Um, and if you want to do this through multiple rounds as data comes in in a stream, um, it comes into one node. It needs to route to a particular node, which is which is in charge of. So it, it it will map the node. It will give it a key. Now that key lives in the key space, and some node will be assigned to the reduce of, with that key. So then that this data. So let's say that it's it's this node that is supposed to do the reduce because. 
the key in your key value pair lives, lives over here someplace. You need to route to this computer in a way that's robust to failure. And then once you're at this, this computer, you need to do the reduce. Well, maybe this computer goes down so he can no longer do the reduce. Um, this was what MapReduce was very good at, right? The, the central node would, would somehow uh, would reroute this. Well, these, these other computers nearby are also going to be capable of, uh, of doing the same reduce job. Um, you somehow will need to aggregate the results at the end. Um, but really, this is meant for streaming data, so really you're going to process it in a stream and maybe update the output of this reduce thing. So if, you're, if the reduce is really, if it's doing word count as taking a sum, you just need to maintain the sum. So you can get more data in and you can update the sum. Um, so you can do these sorts of operations um, inside of kind of a streaming version of MapReduce in these systems. Um, as far as I understand, they were not implemented as, as robustly as MapReduce is or maybe even Hadoop, and so the, they haven't quite made a splash. Um, also, this distributed hash table is built for much more uh, um, redundancy than, um, than, than MapReduce is. And I don't think they quite needed this much, much redundancy in the, in the system. It's kind of a very pretty idea. It doesn't need a central node like, like MapReduce does. Um, so I think you, so you can adjust some of the concepts here. You probably don't need 500 nodes and then the neighbor said to do the route, or maybe you want more than 500 nodes so the routing is faster. You don't want to have to wait 32 steps or whatever, however, however big your key space is. You can shrink the key space accordingly in some way. Um, so the, so there, those, those concepts were built on top of this. Um, there, there's also, there are other systems built on this, uh, this distributed hash table, there's something called a uh, publish subscribe system. So it's funny, we're talking about technology in the last 10 years, but, but already um, it seems like RSS is almost, is, is, is almost dead. But one of the applications was if you wanted to do RSS, you wanted to get updates anytime someone, say, they update their blog. Right? So you would subscribe to the blog um, people hardly even blog anymore, so this that word is becoming outdated. But um, I need to update my examples um, uh, from two years ago. Uh, so, uh, so if, if you subscribe to someone's blog and there and you're you're here, then the then the when the blog is announced, it wants the system will send it out to everyone in the network. Well, if you have a million people subscribing to your blog. You don't want to send it directly to everyone. That's kind of wasteful. So what you do is, for everyone in this, so the first step, if, if someone's in this key space, you're going to send it um, some way. But if they're in the other half of the key space, you send the blog to one person over here. OK? And then, and then if, it's in, um, if, if it's in one of uh, two of these half key spaces, if it's in this quarter, it sends to someone locally. If it's in this quarter, it sends to a single person. If it's in this half, it sends to a single person. So each node is responsible only to sending to only uh, on like log in other computers. Um, it doesn't need to send to all million. No one sends to all million. Each of them only sends to log in system. And so this really reduces the traffic on the network. Um, and so. There were some, soon after these came out, there were some of these published subscribe systems that were built on top of this. I don't know if these were the, the initial ones, but there have been a lot of technology built on this of, of the speeding up the, the, the routing so that when you need to broadcast something to a lot of people, or not even everyone, but only um, some people in, in, a, in a set, you, you don't need to send it um, no node is responsible for sending it like a, a million times. You can send it only logarithmic time each and have some logarithmic number of jumps. And you can still get it to some a large number of people. Um, so, so there are these systems, uh, these published subscribe systems built on top of these sort of, sort of uh, smart routing protocols as well. Do they also use this for uh, video feeds where you have like one million people trying to pick up a video feed at the same time? Um, yeah, I, 
I would, I would think they'd probably do so something like like that. Yeah, there's, you know, this now this distributed hash table is uh, is meant to be very robust for nodes going down. For video feeds, they probably have some dedicated a dedicated network of, of routers that you would you would you would uh, you would probably try and use. You'd probably um, find a good set of routers, and if it's if it's some if it's a company like uh, like Hulu. I don't know if this is how it works for sure, but they probably have local copies of all the videos. So there's some server in in Salt Lake that is serving the videos for you on Hulu, so they don't have to send them from from someplace else. Um, so if, if it's oh, not something that's video. live, oh, okay, but if you have local copies, so if it's yeah, live, I, I, I was thinking yeah. of a live case. Yeah, if it's live, you know, I'm not sure how how, how it would work. I'm I'm guessing they would use something like this uh, this. They're trying to do something like this broadcast, and they're gonna not route it directly to everyone. They're gonna send it to someone, and then that person will split split the feed. Yeah. Um, so in, in a more if you're setting. sending it to home people with home grade DSL lines, each person may only be able to feed two others. Yeah, yeah. Well, the people with the DSL lines are not gonna be the routers, right? So when you're so in this peer to peer network, that's the case, right? They're sending stuff from home computer to home computer, right? But when you're doing video feed, you're, so what happens is like there, um, there are companies like Akamai, so, 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 um, so who's heard of Akamai? Okay, that's pretty good. So Akamai is one of the most important companies in the internet that, that, um, that no one knows about. They, they, they put <laughs> routers, um, they put machines with, with hard drives and uh, internet connections close to backbones all around the US and around the world. And so when you load CNN, you're not looking up in Atlanta, where CNN is based to the router. There's a local copy on campus someplace. Um, there are probably a couple Akamai servers on campus that have the data stored, which is, um, and, and you're just getting the data locally. That's how you can get the web page so quickly. Um, and a lot of, um, I'm guessing, so, so Akamai is kind of a services company, but a company like, like Hulu probably would have to um, replicate, would probably try and have their own servers someplace locally, so they don't, um, because they would take up so much of, of Akamai's feed, probably cheaper for them to do it themselves. And so something that's routing live video probably needs to uh, have some dedicated servers in place around the country. I'm guessing, so one of the biggest live video feeds have, is, um, the NCAA tournament, CBS has been doing this, and it's, and it's, they've kind of done an amazingly good job that there are hundreds of thousands, I don't know, probably millions of people watching in their offices during the day um, these video feeds, and they come in at pretty good quality. Um, I believe they, they place dedicated servers around the country that they rent over that period of time. And they say, you know, we're going to buy this bandwidth, and they know how much traffic they're going to get, and they say we need this many servers to, to they, and they have a dedicated routing network. It's not going to be kind of a randomized thing like this. If your local part of the routing network goes down, your feed probably slows. Whereas this would probably be able to adjust and recover a bit quicker. Yeah. So, so these, that's why I said these. Public subscribe ideas have kind of are beyond just the backbone distributed hash table. All right, so um, so so we'll we'll do distributed streaming on Friday. Um, if you have any, um, so I'll I'll just say a couple words about the project presentations next week. I'll put out a, a list on Friday. Um, so I I, the, 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 I expect all of you to come. I, I think it'll be actually be pretty interesting. Just about every topic we've covered in the class, someone has done a project on, and they'll be able to tell you more about kind of the the experience of actually using these technologies. So I didn't get a chance to, to organize all of this, so we'd actually um, talk about more of the implementation details. So I'm hoping that the people giving the presentation will be able to tell a story about what what they had to do to get it to work, and then once they got it working, what was their experience? Were they able to get actual savings by, by using some of these systems? Do they think they would have been able to do it on, on a single computer or you know whatever, a traditional system? 
that they are able to get advantages over using one of these concepts we learned in class. So I hope it's both educational for everyone who's listening to these talks and that the, the people who are giving the talks are able to kind of describe their experience and, and give some, some insights into these different processes. So I'm hoping to hear about what you did and, you know, um, in each of you had some goals, usually some small analytical goal, but I'm also hoping you tell a story about the process of getting into work. Um, so, um, yeah, so, and, so I think every, everyone will get, call, I've said the work, get roughly 10 minutes per person in the group, so prepare accordingly. Um, if you're not used to giving presentations, 10 minutes may seem like, may seem like a lot, it'll probably go by pretty quickly. Um, so you, you'll need to be organized in what you're doing, and you can practice 10 minutes once without taking too much time. So please at least practice once so you roughly know how long it's going to take. Okay.